All right, what's up, War Gamers? We're back again at Champions of War, and today we're going to be talking about battle tactics and deployment. Big question. It's a big one. It's literally everything about Asia Sigma, and it really does set the pace of the game. Armies that can get easy and comfortable battle tactics whilst being able to have a great deployment, generally you will see have very high win percentages. And being a Cruel Boys player, we do have access to some pretty good battle tactics. And our deployment is very, very, very important compared to just about every other list. Because we're very fragile and we need to make sure that things go clear. So, number one, let's get into battle tactics and what that, what that means. Now, at the start of your hero phase, you can still elect to roll your primal dice first before picking your battle tactic. So it's really important that when we're looking at our battle tactics that we have on option, especially for Auric Warclans and our book-specific ones, and that really helps us determine what we're going to pick and um, you know whether you're a good army or not. And we've got here... Excuse me, sorry about that. Time to get stuck in. Uh, you can pick this battle tactic only in your first or second turn. You complete this battle tactic um, if the model picked to be your general and all other models in your army that are on the battlefield are within 12 inches of an enemy unit at the end of the turn. Okay, so this is great versing Alpha Strike armies. You know, if people want to put a bunch of stuff in reserve and drop you turn 1 or turn 2 and be everything outside of 9, bang, we get that free battle tactic. Tick that one off. Um, we want to be ticking it off early. Uh, because you can only get in your first and second battle round. Okay. Um, I've just wiped out a couple of the ones that obviously weren't relevant and that we can't get because we're not Iron Jaws and those sorts of things. Um, the other one we can go for is Take That, Your Suckers. Very common one. Every Cool Boys player should know it and use it every single game. It's a classic round two, round three um, grab. And it's one where you're going to be hitting with your bolt boys, shooting a lot, and not really fighting in combat very much. So you just got to do 10 wounds or mortal wounds in any combination that were caused by friendly units um, and allocated to enemy models. And you just got to take fewer than 10 mortal wounds. Uh, very easy to get. Again, keep your eyes open because times will come where this might be hard to grab. So pick your timing correctly. And make sure that you can get a lot of shooting done, lift a bunch of units before they get to hit you back. Uh, sneak up. Sounds easy. Great for big war. If you're only wanting one, or only going to run one cruel boys unit, keep it next to a terrain feature. But for us, it's our entire army needs to be within three inches of any terrain feature and more than three from all enemy units. So it's one of those ones that you're going to be looking at more at either early early on in the game before any charges are happening or you're going to be looking at it at round four round five even possibly um it's one that sometimes i take in case i can't get magical dominance off guaranteed i will then do sneak up turn one because it's one that you know i'm not going to be able to get it most likely around two round three maybe even round four so round five it's either round one or round five that i'm picking it um, and then if I haven't, if I've used it round one, then maybe I'm looking at magical dominance round five. If I have gotten to that point and I've tabled my opponent, cause I get it guaranteed. Um, so keep that in your back pocket. It's always good in case you run out of something or you're a bit scared of going for magical dominance cause you may have deployed incorrectly and he's deployed within your, um, unbind range. Um, always look out for that. And if that does happen, maybe even consider if you know you can take turn one or you're going to get turn one. Maybe super sneaky gops back out of the way. So that way you can guarantee it regardless. Um, or sometimes you super sneaky gops back forward to deny magical dominance of your opponent. Um, this is a list of the battle tactics on just your GHB, the 23 to 24 model. Um, you got Intimidate the Invaders, Reprisal, Endless Expropriation. You got um, Magical Dominance, Magical Mayhem, Bait and Trap led into the maelstrom, surround and destroy. Out of all of those, the ones that are of value to us are these ones. So you've got Magical Dominance, Intimidate the Invaders, 
led into the maelstrom, surrounded a destroy, and I just left reprisal in there because you just never know. It's one that you generally probably won't use very often because if your general's dying, if it's just like Draco, you've probably lost the game at that point. But sometimes you might be able to, you know, maybe the the guy, the unit that did kill your general only has a couple of wounds left and maybe you've still got six bolt boys and you can just shoot him down charge in kill it and you get a free battle tactic that way and you can kind of just keep in the points on on that in that area um so it's always worth just having in your back pocket as well um intimidate the invaders is a good one to get around either round three or four or five um towards the end of the game um and if you're really stuck round two um if you can move out of your deployment especially in deployments that are like one by two deployments or one by four deployments so it's quite small and you can just move up a couple of units and you're out um magical dominance i try and go for round one as much as possible because it's a good one to get out of the way for us but like i said you can switch that around with sneak up let into the maelstrom good one um make two charges one battle line one hero one within combat at the end of the turn um it's one that you will tend to pick probably round three um or two even um, but round three is probably generally the one where you're going to be taking that, charging in, getting it all, get everything stuck in, calling your crew of boys while, lifting a bunch of stuff, hope trying to keep at least one of your battle line in, in combat, um, which should be quite easy. You generally can get it off um, as long as you don't die on the punch back if anything that is still in combat is there. Um, but it's generally a one that's a pretty safe one to get. Uh, Surrounded Destroy is one that isn't, e is not easy for us to get. It is a late game turn uh, setup, so maybe round, you're going into round four. You're probably thinking, okay, maybe I go for intimidate the invaders round four. I've used everything else. I've used sneak up. I've used magical dominance. I've used um, let into the maelstrom. I'm now round four. Intimidate the invaders, and then I'm setting up in that round four to set up for a round destroy, um, surround and destroy. Because generally we table our opponent by round three, or we're tabled ourselves. So if we're in the position to get to that point. We just surround and destroy, get an easy another battle tactic. Um, and don't forget when you're doing this setup, if there are maybe one or two units left on the opponent and you're charging in, pile in closer to that corner edge that you need to get to. Pile in closer to your grand strat if it's war, which I run a lot of the time, have a general or battle line in the um, enemy's deployment. And I try and keep my general, who's a sludge raker, alive to the very end. And if he is, he's charging in in the round four, killing that last model, piling in towards my enemy territory and then when it's round five i may be fastening him up if i haven't used it yet or i'm auto running him another 16 inches up the board just to get me there um, which generally should be enough to get you into their deployment zone um, so i've just quickly broken it down as a summary here so um, round one magical dominance or sneak up or get stuck in surround and destroy iffy depends on your list uh, round two intimidate the invaders sneak up get stuck in, potentially Surround and Destroy. At that point, I don't think Surround and Destroy is really going to be much of an option. Again, it's very depending on the battle plan and your list on what you're going to be running. Um, round three, your best ones are Let Into the Maelstrom, Intimidate the Invaders if you haven't done it yet, and Take That, your suckers. They're your three really good um, options there. Okay? Um, take That, your suckers can even be done turn two if you need it. And then round four, it's just kind of leftovers at that point. Do you have Surround and Destroy? Do you have a reprisal? Do you have Sneak Up? Do you have Intimidate the Invaders? Do you, what else is left? Um, and that's why I like to say, stress the importance that led into the Maelstrom round two or like round three especially is important there because at least then that's, you can only really get that if there's a um, units left of the enemy. So get that early on, leave the rest, the easy ones till later. You're having a smooth game. Um, one really good thing to know if you're if you've got good tempo for the match is when your opponent is stuck on choosing what battle tactics and if you see them umming and ahhing a lot it means you're in a really good position if you're very new to the game um it's something that you can easily overlook and i noticed that in my uh, i'm still i'm only i've maybe only played at best around 30 or 35 games um of cruel boys um and along my learning process early on um i used to see see my opponents or what battle attacks do I do this turn or I'm like I can't do this I can't do that it's a good way of like you saying that you've put them in a position that's made their game very hard and you can easily capitalize 
and grow and take advantage of the game from there on forward. Um, so think about it. Put some thought into your battle tactics. Build your list around your battle tactics because your list is what unlocks you these unlocks your battle tactics. Um, like I mentioned in one of my previous videos, it's very important to build your list around the battle tactics you plan to take um, during the battle. You know, round one, I'm going to do this. Round two, I want to plan to do this. Round three, I want to plan to do that. Round four, I want to do this. Round five, I want to take this battle tactic. What's my list going to allow me to do? Do I need a lot of movement? You know, if I want to do surround and destroy turn one guaranteed every turn, maybe I need some high movement units on either side of the battlefield that can move up, stay within that six, and then punch back round two quite quickly. Um, you need access to these types of options. So a big one deployment it's our bane it's my bane it's it's what's really caused me and is forcing me to grow as a player is deployment because so many of my games are lost in deployment and you will find a lot of your games are lost in deployment because of this very reason and the way you drop your army the in the order you're dropping things that what you're showing the information to your opponent is very very important you keep your cards as close to your chest as possible during deployment until they have no other option but to drop everything else um, and you can sometimes you react to what they're dropping in wh where they're dropping it if you see you know if they're going a warlord battalion they've got 10 30 drops whatever it might be um, a lot of drops and or four drops Generally, cool boys, we want to be as low drops as possible. Two drops, preferably, is the lowest you can really go. Four drop if you're running Andorian Acolytes, okay? Um, so you're generally going to be dropping your whole army before they do if they're a high drop list. Check where they're putting their heroes down. Check what they're doing. Is that And ask them when they put their first uh, first unit down, um, first model down, just ask them, can that, move, can that unit teleport in the hero phase? Can that unit do a pre-game move? Yes or no? If there is a yes there, then you know that, okay, he's putting down this unit there to bluff, that that's where his army's going to be, but he can do a pre-game teleport, a teleport in the hero phase, move things around, don't take it for a grain of salt, wait till he's dropped at least another one or two, two more things after that, and then start to figure out what pieces of his can't move pre-game or in the hero phase, and then you know that's where the gist of his army's going to go, okay? And then you can deploy the rest of your army accordingly. And leave your last battle reg drop with every. You fill that last battle drop with battle reg with everything, and you got maybe Andorian acolytes, or one shaman, or one shaman, and one battle reg that has um, just your slud draker, two hobgrot units, and that's it. Right, your hobgrot units can be super sneaked. Okay, um, give them as little information as possible. Right, not many people know what the slide draker does and if they do good on them um but the other option is gobsrack and i'd rather not put gobsrack down turn one so you can go shaman and shaman right but then people know that your bolt boy is generally going to be closer to your shamans take it or not so generally i like to go the hobgots maybe first with the slide draker then a shaman then a shaman then my last drop is all my bolt boys all my gut rippers my monster killers my kill bow my gobsrack everything's going down on that last drop um, because I've given him as little information as I possibly could, could. So for deployment, and a really important one, is what battle plan are you going to be doing? You've got Geomantic Pulse, Nexus Collapse, Lines of Communication, Every Step Forward. You've got all these types of battle plans, um, and deployment really does come down to what kind of battle plan you're playing. What's your deployment zone? You know, how much room do I have to work with? How far away am I going to be set up away from my opponent? You know, you take something like uh, Geomantic Pulse. Your The closest you can deploy to your opponent is 22 inches away from each other. Whereas other maps are 18 inches to each other. It's a big difference, especially if you're versing an army that's heavy melee focused, heavy cavalry, whatever it might be, and they want to get into turn one and charge turn one. That extra, what is it, four inches difference is huge. Four inches is massive. It's, it, it, it's a difference between having to roll a 11 on a charge dice turn one to a, uh, a seven. A seven's an average on two dice. An 11 
is you gotta get you gotta roll like a god to get that. So know your know your battle plans. Know what type of battle plan it does. Nexus collapse. You know if you have more uh, less points going into battle round two, you get to blow up two objectives, and every unit on that objective takes D three mortal wounds. You know you keep these things in mind. Don't get caught out with it. It's important not to. Another one is what's your plan for the map? What's your plan? You know, you've picked your battle tactics, you've got your list designed, but what's your plan throughout the game as well? So you, you use your battle tactics as your plan as you go through the game. You check where the terrain features are. Um, as a Cruel Boys player, we always want as many layers of screens to make it hard for our opponent to get onto our Bolt Boys. Whether that means um, one unit of 10 Hobgrots in the front screen, then you've got another layer of two units of 10 Hopgots, then you've got two units of 10 Gut Rippers with your monster killers right behind them to then shut off any monstrous actions by the time it gets to that point, right? So you're slowing them down again, you're giving last strike to things, you're making it a lot harder. And then you're also, once those two units of Gut Rippers go up, you get the monster killers behind them, and then you charge in with your Slide Draker, uh, your monster killers, and maybe even Gobsprack for a Cruel Boys War. The monster killers can hit quite hard. They're three attacks per model, Eight models, right? Seven of them can do three attacks. Threes and uh, sorry, fours and threes minus one one damage. It's our only access to rend in a unit, okay? And they're only 135 points. Every any monster within six inches, you pick one monster within six. You deny a monstrous action on a two up, and um, at the beginning of the combat phase, you can pick one monster within six inches. Within six inches, big. Um, on a three up, you give them strike last. If that model is wounded, on a two up, it has strike last. I versed an ogres player the other day. They just had the had everything charging in these big monsters, and he he did his um he did his monstrous action uh, for his three d six like pile in, fly over, deal mortal wounds to everything on d three, and landed in the middle of my army. And as we got to the combat phase, I just said, strike last. Moved up with the Slide Draker, Cruel Boys Ward, moved up, then hit him with the Monster Killers, and it was dead. Perfect. All right. And he had Finest Hour that model. As well. And he all that defensed on it, and I still killed it. Like it's it catches people off guard and it makes them make to see makes them you capitalize on people's mistakes. Okay, um, what you can also do is super sneaky hobgrots a hobrot line forward and zone off the enemy round one. You see maybe they piled a lot of their units in one area and you see there's a, a choke point going through the middle of the map that's maybe 15 inches in width. You just set up one unit of nine Hobgrots outside nine of them in that choke point and completely choke it off. That means that they can't go anywhere except nine inches up the board. And if they give you turn one, then you can move them up forward another five inches or run them six inches up. Then you're outside three. Where are they going to go? They're forced to charge into you. I generally don't like to charge in with my Hobgrots turn one because Hobgrots are just going to die anyway. So what's the point? You might as well force them to charge into you. Um, now, if they've got flying, okay, maybe don't go all the way through outside three inches because most things are going to move more than three, in, uh, like six inches up the board if they got flying. So maybe move up and move up outside of eight inches. So you're forcing them to move outside of three of you. Not many things are going to fly uh, if you're at eight inches plus another three if they want to land behind you. Um, and then depending on their base width, it's probably going to be more than that as well because you could add. Or if they're front of their base to the three inch to be outside of three of you, well, they're going to need maybe another two inches on top of that. So it's eight plus five all of a sudden. And that's 12 inch movement. Okay. Maybe things were flying. If they've got a 12 inch movement, keep them on the nine inch mark. Just know what their movement characteristic is to set that up. Um, check where your terrain pieces are. This is one that I have fallen for many times, right? Because you want to get sneak up at some point. So when you're deploying, check where your terrain features are before you even deploy anything and say, if I'm not going to get Magical Dominance off turn one, 
and I need to super sneak, am I going to be able to get it with the way I've deployed? Right? Keep it in mind. It's important. Place wizards outside of 30 inches of your opponent to guarantee magical dominance. Beware of heroic willpower. It's a noob killer. Right? Opponents lists can capitalize on your own deployment as well. And drop as little information as possible each drop until you're finished. Hobgrot line that you can super sneak pre-game, drop them first then. Because they're going to see this hobgrot there. They're going to say, okay, that's where he's going to be setting up his screens. That's where I can position here. No, those hobgrots are going to be moved anyway. Right? Keep your cards close. Once again, it's very important. Once you have that in place, then we've got to analyze, okay, what are our strengths as cruel boys? We can blow up single units per turn as we pick. We pick that unit, we blow it up. Bolt boys can melt anything with hasty shot at 12 inch range, right? If you're running green blades. If you're running big yellows, 15 inch range. And if the opponent has no ward saves, you can kill anything we want when we want with that double shot, okay? So you always got that in your back pocket. So surprisingly strong round one as well. You got the noisy rackets, minus one to wound first battle round. And if you got your gut rippers out there, that's minus one to hit by any other battle line or chaff unit. So minus one to hit, minus one to wound first battle round catches people off guard. And they expect they're going to kill you, lift up a whole screen of gut rippers like that. And they don't. And you leave maybe three or four alive or two alive. It just stops what they're going to do. It forces them to be in combat for one more turn. You can retreat, set up, and make sure that they need to charge that unit again. Perfect. It works out exactly. We've just gotten double value out of one unit, and we've got another whole layer of screen out of it. Your cruel boys, wow. First strike with three units in combat. Huge. Right? Our spell law is very good at debuffing enemies and making their double turns not as good. So if they force you to take turn one, you want to prioritize with your spells and making sure that, okay, if you know you're versing a list that is going to want to give you turn one and maybe you've deployed far back in the board and they say, actually, I want you to move up closer to me so I can get some charges off quicker and get into you quicker around one, then maybe it's a time to super sneaky gob track up forward. Okay, you go sneak up as your turn one battle tactic and you prioritize casting Choking Mist, Summon Boggy Mist. So now all of a sudden you've got a board wide minus one to charge, plus one to charge for you. Makes it harder for them. And you've got a um, minus one attack characteristic and the enemy can't one run in a six inch bubble that you've picked on the map from Gobsprack. And you give Mystic Shield to maybe your front layer of Gut Rippers. So if they want to take to round two, round three, uh, Sorry, round bottom of round one going into round two double turn. Fine. You've got all these debuffs on you. I'm actually quite happy with that. It means that all your everything that I picked in that six inch bubble got one less attack characteristic. And you got minus one to charge as well for two turns now. And I've got a, a, a Mystic Shield on my Gut Rippers for two turns as well. Helping me with my rend, helping me keep them alive a little bit longer. It's It, it can really um, slow things down for your opponent. Um, and you've got Gobsprack for sniping heroes if they cast. So you've got the once per game 3d6. If you unbind with a roll of a 10 or greater, they take d6 mortal wounds. Okay? Snipe heroes with it. You roll that 6 on a d6, most heroes are 6 wounds. You just kill a hero sometimes for free. Um, most, of the, most of them have, most armies have ward saves nowadays. You might not snipe it, but you're going to have it make him double think if he wants to cast again round two or three or four. Um, and that's why I really like taking Andorian Acolytes for this very reason, even though it makes me be a bit high of a drop um, to that four to five drop area. But it means that I can dictate when to gobsprack and do his D6 mortal wounds or something. And it means that people got to really think about when they want to cast and is it really worth it. And if they're willy-nilly casting, you can start sniping a lot of things because you've got two unbinds. Okay. Um, and use your dirty tricks to deny battle tactics such as Surround and Destroy along with your Super Sneaky. 
Okay, so what that means is your dirty tricks, you do disappearing act, you pick up maybe two units or even one unit, or if you get lucky, three units of theirs and put them in reserve. Then all of a sudden it makes it impossible for them to do surround and destroy. It can make it, it makes it impossible. It, if you get the three, it can make it very hard for them to get intimidate the invaders. And all of a sudden you're shutting off battle tactics that your opponent cannot do. You can super sneak in a position where if you see they want to go for a surround and destroy or intimidate the invaders, you super sneaky them up and you block off an area and say, you're not getting that battle tactic this turn. Pick something else. Save that for later on. I now know that you want to set up for that maybe the turn after or the turn after that. So I can then position my army for the next two turns and start countering your battle tactics because that's what's going to win your games. Okay, So we do have strengths. They are there and we can utilize them. But what are our weaknesses? We've got a lot of them. I could be here all day talking about them, sadly. But, you know, we're a fragile army. We rely on screens to get our hasty shots off. You know, we run a lot of Hobgrots, we run a lot of Gut Rippers, the Monster Killers, but they die very fast a lot of the time. Don't expect much out of them either. Uh, we don't have much punch back. The Hobgrots don't do much, next to nothing. Um, you might get lucky and roll well with them, but the chances are not very high. Um, the Gut Rippers, okay, you might spike with them, roll a bunch of sixes and do eight to ten mortal wounds, um, but sometimes you might roll nothing. And if you do fours and fours, no rend, one damage, you're not going to get much of that damage here anyway. So if you don't roll a six on the hits, they're not really doing anything, right? Screening done incorrectly can just lose you the game by end of round two, okay? Movement is everything with us. You're not good at movement. You're not good at deploying. You're going to lose every game. It's very finicky and it's very hard. And I'm finding that it's forcing me to become a lot better at the game quicker. And I think almost stretching me outside of my comfort zone because of how fragile it can be. Um, you know, we generally might have to give up round one and two on points just to set up in a better position to win the game. You know, we don't always need to be looking at five-point rounds every round. That's not what our army is, and that's not what we're going to do. And that's a weakness, because we're pretty much saying, okay, you're going to have points advantage the whole game until I kill enough stuff of yours where I can start scoring. You know, is that a competitive list? You know, it's hard for us. It's doable. Um, there's matchups where we are in a better position to win, but that's something you've got to bear in mind, you know. Maybe we need we need to give up those first round and second battle round. Okay. Um, small deployment zones gives us less space for movement and easier for our opponent to get charges on round one. Okay. So be aware of that. Maybe deploy deeper in your territory and Hobgrot's getting charged first. So you spread out deeper in your territory rather than being closer to that deployment. If you've got a small deployment zone and they're close together, just deploy at the far back and just set up those screens from there. You know, if your screens and your super sneaky done incorrectly backfires quite quickly on you, things can die very fast in our army. We've got low braveries, our saves are five ups in general, things just fall over to wind. So what I wanted to talk, talk about next is breaking down each battle plan and what my thought processes are and I'd love to hear your guys' feedback on what you think and maybe ways that I could be doing it differently. But when I look at one like Geomantic Pulse, I'm looking at tile sizes, I'm looking at my list design and I'm saying, okay, I've got a 1x4 um, deployment zone. How many screens have I got? How many Bob Boys have I got? How many Heavy Melees have I got? You know, my Heavy Melee list. Have I got a hero stacked? You know, and then I've got to position and say, okay, well, do I want to take control of the middle of the battlefield? Do I want to set up so um, if he takes turn two and I get, um, you know, if I'm going second turn two, I can pick where the pulse is and then I'm setting up in that way. Um, you know, if you have lower drops, you can dictate and say, I'm going to give you turn one, you take second, uh, you go second of that round one, and you have a bit more control of the pace of the game and where you're moving. Um, you know, don't move up too fast. You know, you've got a 22 inch space here, small deployment, intimidate the invaders is going to be an easy one to get. 
So always keep that in your back pocket. You know, even consider putting Bolt Boys right on the front deployment line if you need to. You're pretty far away, but 22, you're at a 24 inch range, maybe 27 with big yellows. You're getting right into their deployment. You're giving them barely any room to deploy in. And if they've got big models in there and big heroes that have bases of six inches, well, no matter what, with big yellows in particular, you're going to be hitting everything. You can hit its turn one with everything. But check where your terrain is, tick things off as you go, and making sure that you're deploying necessary to what your opponent's deploying. Nexus Collapse. Hard, but simple. That's my answer. Don't deploy on any objectives. We're an army that can't move fast and wants to sit back and move forward slowly. So deploy in your back territory here. Do not deploy anything on, on, your, on an objective. Maybe super sneak a hoggrot line forward, not touching any objective and denying off and zoning off an area. And then if you can, at every time, give turn one on Nexus Collapse. Always give turn one away. It's going to help you. See what they do first. Are they going to take one objective? Are they going to sit on two objectives? Right? If they sit on two objectives and they go for one, two, and more for the five points, turn one, that's fine for us. And we're happy to just say, okay, we'll take one objective and our battle tactic. So we got one. We can even take two, sorry. You can you can sit on two yourself. So you got one, two, but not more, right? And your battle tactic, that's four points. You're one point down. Going into round two, you blow up two of their objectives. A lot of the time, a lot of armies going to want to get up on, on you anyway. So you blow up theirs. As long as it's not yours, you're happy. And you're fighting over here. But you're fighting where the only objectives are. Okay? Now, don't deploy too heavily in there where you're denying them from getting on the points because then going into round two, they might not even get on them and just fight you outside of the deployment. Maybe get their battle tactic. Maybe only take one objective maybe two, and get four points themselves. And then that leaves you in an awkward position, okay? Because if that if that happens, then you've got two, and you're going to score four again. You want to be making sure that you're not scoring more than them, and they can control that by depending on how many points they want to contest. Maybe they just take one point, get three points. Then it forces you to say, shit, how am I going to get away, rid of one point? You can't just give them up, okay? And then he's going to blow stuff up. Maybe he blows these two up on you. So you always want to be scoring as little points as possible, depending on what your opponent does. You know, round two, do you want to take the double turn or not? Depends how close he is. Can you get the double shots off? Yes or no? No? Okay, maybe consider giving him the turn, seeing what he does again. And you fight for the round two to three double turn. Right? This is a reactive map especially for cruel boys. You do not want to be taking five points a turn on this one because you'll just get stomped and you'll get caught out. You'll be forced to run up and do things that you don't want to be doing and you'll just lose the game. It's happened to me a couple of times and you got to learn from your mistakes and I'm trying to teach you my mistakes. Lines of communication. Similar to Geomantic Pulse. Okay. You can disrupt their charge phase, movement phase, make them spend an extra CP, you know, again, small deployments, one by four, one by four, you know, this is one where people generally want to be looking for surround and destroy turn one, so look for your noisy, uh, sorry, your disappearing act dirty trick to lift up some units on the corners and turn off their surround and destroy turn one, because this is a great map for it, okay, um, you turn that off turn one, then all of a sudden maybe they're forced to do Intimidate the Invaders turn one, depending on their what their um, faction is. Okay, um, you make them do Intimidate Invaders turn one, that's perfect for you, because you still have the chance to try and turn off around and destroy turn two, because they'll drop them down turn two, and maybe you super sneaky something up here, right? And when you take the turn and he maybe finishes deploying, you can say, well, I'm going to have super sneaky here. If you want to take this, you have to charge in and then we can pile in and contest each other. You can maybe find some way to stop it. Or at the very least, you're forcing them to do surround destroy turn two, which is 
forcing units to be trapped six inches of the board edge, which is perfect for you. It's beautiful. It's what you want. Every step forward. We're very close to each other. Deployments get really small in these little neck points here, but the block of it is quite good. Now, on this sort of map, what I've found to work really well is one, check terrain features. How big are the terrain features? Do you have line of sight of the whole map no matter where you've positioned your bolt boys? If that's the case, deploy deep in your territory. Okay. Deploy deep in the territory. Maybe even have just one unit on here. Hobgrot line, Hobgrot's lines, gut rippers back all the way back here. Your monster killers with your sludge raker. Bolt boys, bolt boys, maybe a kill bow in here and your gulps rack right in the corner. Okay. And you want to set it up so no matter who you're versing, especially if I'm playing Greening Blades, I want to set up my screen so no matter where they come turn one, um, they're going to be outside 12 of my Bolt Boys, but within 24 to get a first shot off on the first battle round. Okay. Um, and then I want to be delaying it round two, give them the turn potentially. Um, most likely if I win priority, I might just give them the turn again, depending on how the map looks. Give them a turn again. Maybe they go a little bit deeper into your screens and then you're looking for the hasty shot bang, into a double turn, another hasty shot round into everything. You get two rounds of hasty shots off in a row before they get to do any movements. You win the game from there. Um, I've found deploying deeper in this one's a bit better and making sure that there's no terrain features that block line of sight, say from where your bolt boy is going to be to this corner and where your bolt boy is going to be from this corner to this corner and making sure you get full vision of the map. If there is a terrain feature that blocks vision quite comfortably, Okay, you want to be deploying something behind that line, making sure that they can't deploy anything within range. And if they do move up from here to here, that they're still going to be outside 12 of your important key pieces and only hitting your hob grots or maybe some hot gut rippers at best. But then if they are going to be within here, you've got bolt boys here, say it's 12 inches there, and you've got maybe a line of hob grots here and some gut rippers there. At best, they're going to be 18 inches away from your bolt boys. And 24 inches goes all the way back to here, from here, right? You got 11, 22, 24. So if you've got gut rippers, uh, bolt boys on this line, and maybe some gut rippers here, okay, and maybe some hog grots here, they're not going to get anywhere near them, but you're going to get that double shot off all the way up to here, which generally they're going to be in. So you're, you're locking down all this area of the map, all from here, all the way to here, to here, to here, to here is 24 inches. And you're deployed all in this little section here, right? Limited resources, big deployment zones, a lot of objective points. Again, what we're trying to do here is you're a big deployment. You need to be outside nine, we want to be making sure that we've got enough screens to set up. You've got to be careful of any teleports. Where do you want to set up? Maybe pick one corner and creep up. Um, but this is a map that really does hurt us because it forces you to move objectives and move around a lot and they can shut off objectives and things like that. And it makes it quite awkward. Um, so again, playing it similar to Nexus Collapse, reactive, how many points your opponent's getting, how many points you're controlling, moving forward and taking control that way. Again, deployment, always hobgrots forward, hobgrots, gut rippers, then bolt boys. You want at least two to three layers, okay? Um, with your slide draker in the middle. Always spreading everything out, keeping things nice and tight and moving up slowly, okay? That's how we work and that's how we want to deploy. Um, spring the trap. Again, small, tiny deployment, one by two, right? You've got a little bit into this territory you can deploy in, and that's it. So things are going to be clumped up. This is a great one for 10 ho 20 hobgrot screen, 20 gut rippers, bolt boys, bolt boys, kill bow, and maybe even just super sneaking something forward outside of nine on this side, outside of nine on this side and just locking them down and forcing them into here, right? So if your plan is to do hobgrots, 
um, if they've got the things deployed here, you're going to be nine inches. Maybe you've got hobgrots to stringed out this way to say, okay, if you want to come over here, you're going to be stopped by hobgrots and you're going to be slowed down. And you, this is your opening point. So maybe we layer a little bit more on this side and we flare around and we do some shooting. This is a great map to take turn one and do shooting straight away and just soften up any screens in the front. Um, if people deploy badly on this one because they don't have much room to work with, generally they're going to be within 24 um, inches of you on turn one. So you can get a turn one shot off and just soften up a few things straight away. So consider taking turn one on this one um, and even consider deploying your bolt boys aggressively um, to get even a potential for a double shot or even super sneaking your bolt boys up forward if you need to. Uh, because that can really hurt your opponent as well. So depending on how they play, you can maybe super sneak some bolt boys up forward if they deploy deep and just go shoot, shoot. Or if you put your bolt boys all on the front line, you super sneaky your 20 gut rippers or maybe 10 gut rippers or whatever you've got in the front here to defend them. And then run gut rippers up, hobgrots up, run everything up to flare out and screen for you. Fountains of Frost is where Andorian Locust's units count as 10 models on objectives when they're contesting them. Um, at the start of Battleshock, um, roll the dice for each objective. There's three units or more. On a four up, each unit contesting that objective suffers D3 mortal wounds. So this one again, don't keep keepers. You only want two units at best on each objective because we don't want to be taking D3 wounds at any point. Um, and big small deployments, big gap between each territory, really good one for the disappearing act and keeping them stuck in their territory. Um, good one for having heaps of areas to move for, for super sneak, um, and really setting the pace early on and flaring out your screens and moving up the board. And it's one that you can take turn one and still be in a good position, or it's one where you can take turn two, um, and make them move up the board. And then you're getting your shots off and everything and taking, um, giving them round two even, making them move up the board again, and then you're going round to bottom of round two on your turn, and you're getting hasty shots, and then you're taking a double turn and getting another round of hasty shots, and that's where you want to be fighting for your doubles is round two to three. That's where Cruel Boys really shines. Okay, so ice fields, huge deployment zones. Um, when units run, D3 mortal wounds, make a charge roll. Each one that shows an unmodified roll, um, another D3 models, so don't be running. Um, we don't really charge much anyway, so that's fine. If we do, okay, we're going to take the damage, but that's fine. Um, but with the, these types of large deployments, you really want to be careful of disappearing act and not letting them deploy too far up the board. Because what happens is you might disappearing act a unit that only moves four inches, and all of a sudden it's moved up 15 inches on the board because they've got so much room to work with and they can move right outside of nine of you a lot of the time and then just charge you that turn or attempt to charge. So be careful with disappearing act with these big deployments. I've noticed that it can really hit you in the face and hurt you um, if you've picked the wrong units to put into reserve. So always be aware on this map and maybe just take lethal surprise and nausea rackets. Power Flux is one that, you know, can test objectives. If you have less points at the start of battle round two, you can decide whether A and B, A and A are active or B and B are active. Um, it's one of those ones that can force you to be in a weird position, but I find as cruel boys that generally it's all right. Um, most of the time you've either got one of the Bs or one of the As, and you can just position to have your army in this sort of area and have your bolt boys controlling these two points. So you're always going to be contesting one of the power fluxes whenever they're activated. Um, and we can quite comfortably do that of forcing them to be, uh, you know, uh, within our 12 shot shooting range of our bolt boys. Frigid Zephyr, it's a crap map for us. It's probably an auto lost nearly 99% of the time. Um, no matter who you verse, it's going to be a loss not being able to do any long range shooting and they're coming up into you, you're going to lose pretty much all those games. I wouldn't put too much thought into this map if you do happen to get it. Um, my deployment thoughts are 
no joke, try and put a, a, a hero as far up as possible, one of your Swamp Claw Shamans, super sneaky up forward, um, your, your Bolt Boys, right? Give them the poisons, do a move and shoot for, um, for whatever you can hit because otherwise they're not going to be doing anything for a long time. So it's 240 points. Try and lift another unit worth of equal value. And at least you're getting something done turn one. Okay. If you if you don't have control over priority, then just super sneaking up forward. Uh, just hobgots or gut rippers and being annoying and trying to get into, into their face as soon as possible. Slow them down. Um, or even if you want to be a bit extra safe, deploy really far back in your territory and just move up slowly, move up slowly, keeping those 12-inch bubbles around your screens so your, your bolt boys do have the opportunity to move up and shoot them, okay? No reward without risk. Another map that's really hard for us because people can deploy in combat with you right on the edge of their deployment. So... If you're versing any army that's heavy cavalry, want to get in your face ASAP and charge you, you're probably going to lose. Um, it's really hard to deploy. Again, these types of maps deploy deep in your territory. Give round two, but around one and two up on points. Try and only get your battle tactics for those two rounds. Don't even bother about contesting objectives unless you can do it. But I, my priority is Bolt Boys right in the deep back. Slide Draker, Kill Bow, 20 Gut Rippers, 20 Hobgrots, 10 Hobgrots, maybe contesting these two objectives with maybe uh, some Monster Killers sprinkling them in the middle here. And just move up slowly, move up slowly, move up slowly. If they force you to take turn one, move up only a little bit to contest these two objectives. If you've already got them both, just don't even move. Okay? Or move just five, your five inches and that's it. Nothing else. Stop. Stand there, wait for the hit. It's going to hit you hard. Just standard map here. Score one, two, and more. Okay, so controlling both of these objectives is going to score you one, two, and more. And you can stop your opponent scoring five points. So if you score one, if you score three points, they're going to score three points. If you score five, they're going to score two at best. Okay, so scoring five points, keeping control of these two objectives wins you this game quite comfortably. And wins you the map. So you've got to be positioning your bolt boys in range of both of these. 12 inches from you want to measure it. Bang and bang. Have your uh, maybe your kill bow favored to one side. So you can make sure you control at least one of them at all times. Or even your kill bow in the middle to hit both of them and hit whatever you need to hit, whatever heroes get in range. And you want to have hobgrots, hobgrots, gut rippers, gut rippers. And then you want to super sneaky something in the back here. Force them to stay back in their territory. If they deploy badly, super sneak behind them. Because they need to move forward to get these objective points. And to be able to score, be scoring points ever, they need to be on these two points. So if you can drag things off of there and into the back of their corners and deployments, it just gives you another chance to get what you need to get. And again, be careful of disappearing act on these types of maps. Um, I would only be, I'd be disappearing act if I've got the turn. So because your dirty tricks activates after you've decided who takes first turn, if I'm taking first turn, I will try and super sneak everything possible, move up, move up, move up. And then all of a sudden they have to be outside of nine of me, which then means I'm running up, I'm running up with my hobgrots, auto running maybe with one in the middle here. Okay. And then I'm taking control of all this area because I have to be outside of nine of me once again from here to here. Um, so they're forced to deploy in this one by four deployment zone. So that wraps up the video, guys. I know I rambled on quite a bit, but deployment and battle tactics is something that's really important and can win or lose you games. I'd love to hear your feedback. Love to hear what you guys are doing in your games as Cruel Boys players. Maybe I'm doing something wrong. I'm learning, I'm trying to adjust, trying to show you guys what I do and what I think is best and what has the highest potential of winning. And again, it's always easier said than done. <laughs> That's one thing I've learned. But, you know, keep trying, keep getting it. Champions of War, we are out. <laughs>